Hello and welcome to the Nature Connection, Science, Wildlife, and Environment Radio, with your hosts Lisa and Nancy. Hey everyone, welcome to Big Glen Radio's fourth Friday Nature Connection show. It's a collaboration with our friend Margot Carrera, and Margot is an amazing nature photographer. And you know what? We love this uh, show. Every you know fourth Friday we get together, and it's been interesting this year. It seems that we're talking a lot about gardening. It, I, you know, when it, we talk a lot about nature, obviously nature and gardening is a huge thing, and and we do a lot in regards to climate change and. I think today's show is going to really delve into that because our backyard space, even patio space, has something that we can do. And today we're going to welcome Jennifer Jewell. She's a gardener, a garden writer, a garden educator, an advocate. Um, also, she is the host of the national award-winning uh, public radio program and podcast, Cultivating Place. In fact, that's her website, cultivatingplace.com. But her book is out today as we record this. I love that this is airing the day before the equinox. Her book is called What We Sow on the Personal, Ecological, and Cultural Significance of Seeds. So welcome, Jennifer. How are you? Oh, I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. It's it's a real pleasure and honor to be with you both. It's good to have you here. Margo, how are you doing over in San Diego? Oh, it's it's starting to feel a little bit like fall. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's cooling down. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Loving it. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Where yeah. are you, Jennifer? I'm up in Northern California, and we are experiencing the same thing, Margot. And it is like a new lease on life to mm. wake up and feel a little bit of cool air and know that the forecast has us in the low 90s instead of, you know, the hundreds. So that's oh, beautiful. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, today we're recording from Durham, North Carolina, and the, we're in the mid 80s. And in the evenings, it get down to the 50s. And where we are is this a magic garden, like a magical, you know, wooded, like, if you want to have Zen, go into the garden. Like, really, this is the most Zen place. And there's even a garden room that you can sleep in and listen to fountains at night. Seriously. Beautiful. Life is good, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that, that's, Jennifer, let's talk about that gardening. I, before we get into everything, and, and seeds, what was your first experience of, you know what, gardening is part of who I am as an individual? Well, I am one of those lucky souls who was uh, raised by a happy and professional gardening mother and a wildlife biologist father. So, oh. and they were both very passionate about uh, their, their focal points in life. Uh, beyond family and kids. And they shared that passion with us. And so, um, you know, I might have experienced days where I said, I don't want to weed, but, uh, but most of the time, I just loved being out in the garden or in the wild with my family. And as I grew up, and I realized that not everybody was raised that way, it became much more clear to me what a gift um, and an asset I had been, uh, you know, gifted, if you will, uh, for this love, but also this knowledge of gardening and putting it to best use. So when I when I sort of progressed in my career as a writer and an editor, and I started writing more about gardens, it became much more um, apparent to me that I wanted to see our mainstream media, magazines, books, radio, television programs that were talking about gardening really elevate and expand the way they were talking about it instead of always focusing on it as a pretty picture or a how-to lesson, that there was much more depth and creative expression and cultural literacy in this act of gardening than we had been reduced to. And I think we're getting much better now. I would say the last 15 years, we have really improved with programs like mm -hmm. yours, with programs like mine, with, you know, people focused on 
the climate change or biodiversity loss or just cultural uh, respect and integrity, I think people are starting to grasp that our gardens are ways that we can address all of these colliding urgencies. Mm-hmm. Even if it's just a little, if we all do it, it makes a huge difference aggregated. I agree. Mm-hmm. And it's very connected to our food system as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, traveling full time and, and being in different gardens all the time, we see how people live. It's like, oh, we want the 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 picket fence and the, you know, manicured everything versus you can go to a place like where we are right now, where there's this balance and of understanding nature. And when you see someone that works with nature and allows nature to be part of your ecosystem, yeah. then you see things flourish in a way that I don't know there, that is the Zen moment. And I, I find like um, we've done garden, garden gossip. We have garden gossip radio as well. And, you know, Margo got us to go on all these gardens everywhere we go. And then we're like, well, Margo, I went to tell her one day, I'm like, um, we do all these national parks. Isn't that a garden? What about this garden? <laughs> these are right, gardens. Right. So now it's like kind of crazy, but so, so going to seeds and talking about seeds, I find very important. I remember uh, doing shows on this, you know, 15 years ago, like what you're saying, um, that really, you're right. It is 15 years ago. And we were doing our garden gossip show and talking about, oh, manicure this and everything. And then starting to actually visit the growers for the nurseries. And then seeing that the garden industry itself was being changed just like our food system, we were seeing this alignment. So like, if you're going to have Thanksgiving turkey, um, and this like diesel turkey, maybe you guys know that in, in California versus yep. here's your typical one in the grocery store. We've lost biodiversity in what we eat and um, in vegetables and an animal, right? Yes. And then we're seeing that in our gardens too, that everything was being done into like, you're going to have this from your box store. And we right. actually visited these growers and they would basically take out the nurseries like as a business. Yeah. I, I, and then suddenly these people weren't on our show anymore. <laughs> Just kind of this crazy thing where we saw like, we're going to come in, take your nursery. You can be a manager and they would take away the biodiversity that That's the right. nursery people were cultivating. Right. And it's mm-hmm. funny because we saw this real, uh, you know, in the 1970s and then again in the 90s, we saw these little like renaissances of small independent growers in different regions who were really focusing mm-hmm. on the biodiversity of their place or just the biodiversity of their own interests, right? I mean, you could probably name right off the top of your head, Lisa, 20 different independent small catalogs that you would get in those years. Mm -hmm. And then with the, the real contraction of the, the diversity of that kind of provider in our system because of so many different things, but often directly related to the cost of land in the places that are good for growing and the cost of shipping and the, just the, the carbon footprint of shipping plants, you see a, a contraction of those. And so just like you say, we now have, you know, a, a large majority of our gardeners going to either chain nurseries or big box stores, and they have a biodiversity of maybe 50 plants where we used to have a biodiversity of 250 plants, which was different by region. And so, you know, it, it's something that it's almost unnoticeable. It's like out here in our periphery. But until we think about the cascading consequences of that, it doesn't seem that noticeable or that important. But once you start thinking about the biodiversity loss associated with that, you're like, wait a second, do I really want to plant the same petunia as everyone else in every state across every town on this continent? Is that really a good idea? Little yeah. boxes on a hillside. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Made out of ticky mm-hmm. tack. You know, but then that's the thing is, um, but we're losing like the seeds, which means that our animals are losing their habitat, the right. bird life. And so we're losing those. Um, and cultures. I love, by the way, uh, what we saw, I love your book. I love that you've written it so personally and 
shown this, you know, year of like, this is what's going on. You know, here's this timeline, because I think that really helps people understand from a personal story. I, yeah. I love how you wrote it. Um, and, and getting into the loss of these seeds, we, I remember doing an interview, I think it was 15 years. <laughs> it is everything 15 years ago. Right. And, um, it was with a museum in Nebraska, Kearney, Nebraska, I think it was. Mm -hmm. Okay. And a Native American lady whose family would was moved from Nebraska to Oklahoma, right? So yeah. heritage wise. And she finally got their their corn seeds had been kept over the years and they wouldn't grow in Oklahoma. But when the museum let her come and plant her corn seeds from her family roots in there, they thrived and they were yeah. multicolored and everything. Right. I'm getting goosebumps. And every time I tell that goosebumps. story, yeah, it's mm -hmm. like, look, that just tells you, like, and that's why I love your title too, Cultivating, you know, this place, because, you know, that to me is such a big deal. Like, this is. is cultural when cultures lived according to their land. So we were more ex coexisting, you know? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think that so much of what is our dominant, you know, cultural mindset in the US, which is, you know, come down to us directly from certainly my uh, ancestors uh, as, you know, colonial European migrants looking for a place to live. Like there's so much displacement and erasure and genocide of plants and human culture um, and animals, mm -hmm. as you say, you know, and there's a lot of hard information in this book. Like I definitely move us through this idea of how and where our plant world has contracted in terms of its human interactions. But then it expands back out into just that that you were referencing, Lisa, and that the importance of the fact that we are all, if you go back enough generations, we all come from land-based people somewhere. And we can rehydrate, as Rowan White of Sierra Seeds uh, says, those memories and those connections and, and take on a much more gentle and inclusive um, worldview that helps us respect other cultures and our plants and our animals. And, and we can do this right from our own gardens. Um, and it's hearing stories like that, that you just shared that I, I share many others just like mm -hmm. it in, in the book, um, the importance of reconnecting different cultures to their seeds. And that's sort of like redemption for someone like me to, to be able to support that kind of work and see it through, um, it gives me hope in our world. Mm. I know, Margo, this really resonates with you, the cultural connection to the land and nature. Yeah, it does. And, um, you know, how we started out um, as people were coming, uh, migrating here, um, the indigenous really were the um, land uh, keepers and protectors. And you talk a little bit about that in the book. You also talk about how um, the animals are so and uh, birds and are so connected to the plants. And when we do away with a certain variety of plants, we're also doing away with the habitat of an animal or a bird. And I just am, I am seeing this now here in San Diego. There are so few birds. I grew mm. up. I grew up to opening my window in the morning and listening to the sounds of birds singing. Um, I cherish every bird I hear now in San Diego because it, it's so few. And um, it, it's, I think it's to do with, we all brought the habitat down to something very small. Mm -hmm. And so these large variety of birds that, eat off a particular plant or the butterflies that eat off a particular plant um, have nowhere to go. Uh, yeah. And so they're dying out. And uh, so it, it brings me great joy to bring it back. And that's what I, I'm hoping your, your book and, and this talk is going to help people do because um, I've seen it in my own backyard. Um, I just planted a few um flowers for the butterflies and uh, this year particularly 
uh, I had a yard full of butterflies this year. That's I mean, so and the, yeah. yeah. And, and when I came here, there was nothing. I had no bees. I had no butterflies yeah. and they, you plant it and they shall come. <laughs> if it, they're around, so they true. will find you and they yeah. will come and they will flourish. And if more people do that, um, by reading your book and, and getting this information out, then, um, we, I see a positive outcome. Me too. Me too. And you, you know, that's the, like that experience that you are living, everyone is living, you know, the, there's some, the, the statistics are terrible. Like since 1970, the North American continent has lost more than 3 billion songbirds. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons for this. You can attribute it to habitat loss. You can attribute it to climate change. You can attribute it to like the terrible um, impact of feral cats or or even just household cats that are left out. But you can also attribute it to that lost diversity of food and shelter and cover along their migration pathways or where they are residents. And, you know, as you said, and I think most gardeners resonate with this, is if you just, if you plant a diversity of plants, you have a tree, you have some shrubs, and then you have a whole lot of flowering plants they'll come. Like, even mm -hmm. if you don't think they're there, they'll find you and you can be just one garden on a block and they will find you. But mm -hmm. imagine if every garden on the block was this pathway reintegrating yeah. spaces, it would be just a, a celebration of birdsong and butterflies and our health and happiness too. And I, I love we're actually recording this on the day your book comes out, September 19th. This is out September 22nd, right? For Equinox, yeah. right? Yeah, on the Equinox, equinox and, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that night. Yeah. And so what, what's exciting to me about fall is the seeds come out, the pods. And I remember even, you know, we, we before we were on the road full time, we were in Tucson, Arizona. We were in California, mm. too. We've, I mean, we've been everywhere. <laughs> Let's just sing Johnny Cash, right? But yeah. it's, but, um, and people used to think the desert had nothing. And I'm like, dude, there's the seed life so and the much. pods and the crazy pods, right? And I know photography wise, Margo, to me, isn't this part of architecture of nature? Like I always looked at like fall and winter, like here's this other architecture, the flowers kind of hid, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Flowers are beautiful, but here comes the seeds and you're starting to see it right now and seeds come yeah. in all kinds of shapes and sizes that gets this yeah. whole other thing that I, I think we should start looking at that. And, you know, I'm an advocate for people to take a walk. They can through their gardens. And to me, when you have a garden, like I'm out four or five times, like, did this bloom yet? Did this do this yet? You know, right. like I'm weird, you know, I geek out on it, but that's what we do. That's what gardeners this, do. I, you're just kind of like, I want to see you doing this. And when you see the actual evolution of it, like we were just watching, we were just in Asheville area of North Carolina. And when we were, we started, it was two weeks ago, everything was green, maybe a few little changing leaves. And every day I could see like, okay, there's more, there's more, there's more. And you can really timeline it. Not like, oh, how did it just become fall? But if you actually watch, yeah, you watch the seed become a seed. And how it furls back from the fruit or the flower, you know, all of that. Yeah, it's amazing. I, I the diversity. People, yeah. yeah, to get that from your book, what we sow is like, there's also joy in seeds and just the beauty of them. Just the beauty and the crazy diversity, right? Like what you're, what you just said, I mean to go through the year really paying attention. And I think of myself as someone who pays a lot of attention. Yeah. But this, this, you know, this sort of research of a couple of years, which I've distilled down into one year, just in my one, you know, what is called seed shed, like, a, you know, it's like a watershed or a view shed, but an area in which the seeds can reach or, or, you know, are taken by birds or mammals. But just in my one seed shed, I saw things I had never seen before, even though I've lived here for a long time and I am attentive. But the, you know, if you think about the fact that our flowering seed bearing plants, there are about 300,000 species on the planet. Only about 260,000 of them have been described. They've been evolving and adapting on the planet for 
around 365 million years. They have figured some mm-hmm. stuff out, right? And they have also all done it in their as a species in their own way. So while some seeds might look similar to other seeds, like each of these are specific evolutionary adaptations to a place, to a climate, to, you know, certain hardships like fire or drought or rocks or whatever it might be. That's like, fascinating. Too. It's phenomenal. Yeah. It, to me, how like you need seeds, to, you know, so Yuma, Arizona, I know none of us are there right now, but Yuma, Arizona, lower Colorado River, um, they started to restore it. Yes. And it had um, all this agricultural runoff and 49 agencies got together, including two different Native American tribes to restore the wetlands. And yep. we were part of the, you know, the beginning, it's now a national heritage area. And um, if canoed through there and you can see exactly where they restored it. The yep. birds are there like a, like I always call it like a curtain of birds. Like you're talking about Margo, as soon mm-hmm. as you get into there, they had a hard time getting the native plants to go back. And it was about the Palo Verde seeds yeah. and being able to shell them. The, the, the guy who was working on all of this, it, he was having a margarita outside his RV because he, he traveled. And he had to, he, it dawned on him to put the Palo Verde seeds in the blender. And that's how they started the restoration of the wetlands to get the seeds to actually har- go. So, right. you know, the restoration of the lower Colorado River, you can thank margaritas for it. I think that is just one of the coolest <laughs> stories ever, right? To do yeah. that. But, um, you know, there's the backyards and the garden spaces, but there's also these places that I think people need to go to. You go to parks, go to places that do demonstration gardens that are beyond your petunias. And that's right. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. right. Because as you noted right in the beginning, they are gardens if we expand what we mean or what we say gardening is. I mean, you go back to the incredible diversity of indigenous cultures just here in the state of California prior mm-hmm. to European contact and still, uh, you know, a huge diversity intact, alive and well, you know, doing what they can to restore their culture, their connection to land and space. And they, as as you noted, have been tending the land for thousands and thousands of years. The way they used prescribed fire, the way they dug bulbs, the way they cultivated their seed collection sites for oh seeds they used for, for food, that's all gardening. It just looks different than what our very small version. So I, I call it gardening with a big G um, rather than gardening with a little G. And I think we have a lot to learn from all of those kinds of spaces and different people's approaches. Exactly, mm. Lisa. There, There's when a lot of the national parks and park units that we've been to show some of those demonstration gardens um, mm-hmm. for the Native Americans and what they've done, which like Bandelier National Monument, Yep. They have some of that. And I'll tell you what, that area is thriving in biodiversity. Yep. Um, places that have used fire in the right way, you start seeing Forbes come up and things like that. It's exciting to see. Yep. Um, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, they have a rail yard. It, ah, the depot, rail yard depot. It's a, it, they've taken this brown space that was toxic. Yep. Rail, Railroads are toxic, right? Yeah, it's a brownfield, exactly. Yeah, that is brown. It is dead, and they got rid of it. They turn it into, and it was also a place where um, homeless, those who are experiencing homeless, were living, which isn't good for them, right? So this is no. so they changed it over. They planted food, which was good, but they redid the area and um, put in demonstration gardens for people to see. So they could see how the water was working, how it can be yeah. filtered. If you put, work with nature, they did waffle gardens. I can't even yeah. explain that. Which are, right. which are like an ancient, ancient practice of the Pueblo peoples in the Southwest, taking advantage of any collection of dew or rain so that it filters the water or it directs the water down to where the plant's roots are. Like it was an ingenious method of drought tolerant gardening and cultivating of crops that goes back thousands of years thanks to the Pueblo people. It's it's fascinating and mm-hmm. how they would do rooftop gardens too. Mm-hmm. Like on on the top of the cliff dwellings. That's another yep. thing. Mm-hmm. But now going going back to seeds, what about I was thinking about this. What about 
the roots and corms and things like that, would you consider that a seed in regards to needing to be saved? Or do you still go further on the seed part with those well, kinds of plants? I definitely talk about different kinds of propagules, different ways that we regenerate plants. But uh, a corm or bulb or rhizome or cutting or a division, anything that's dealing with fleshy tissue, that's much harder to store, seed bank, save. I mean, we okay. do it, but it's harder. So I, I pretty much stayed with the seeds that can be dried and saved over time. But I mostly, so I think it's important that any potential reader out there knows this is not a how to save your seed book. This is not right. a how to grow from seed. This is an exploration of the way seed is being cared for in our world. And so, you know, I gave examples of some of that kind of conservation out in the field that you're just talking about. For instance, the um, kind of in situ, ex situ apple conservation at the Geneva, New York station, where, where they are conserving those genetics through not just seeds, but also the trees themselves and that germplasm. And things like the cranberry conservation that is very tribally uh, directed through the center of the uh, North America where cranberries occur naturally. Now, those are hard seeds to save as seed, but very interesting to be conserving the plants and the, the fruits in place. That makes it a little bit easier. So there's as we know, all kinds of ways to save how plants reproduce themselves. But the important difference uh, with seed, and that includes, it doesn't, no, it doesn't include a bulb and a corm in that same way, but a bulb and a corm create plants that also produce seed, right? So the, right. the, the living tissue of the bulb will create little pups at the bottom and you can divide those, but they are clones of the same plant. The seed that that plant, like think about your daffodil or an onion, think about that. You can get a pup and divide that plant that way and grow it on, but you need the seed to get the sexual reproduction. And that sexually reproduced seed creates the genetic diversity that is so important mm -hmm. in our plant communities and for our bi biodiversity across the world. And, and this becomes important in this exact moment where people like you and me are saying we need to plant more native plants. We need to restore and reconnect these native habitats. If we're only doing that by cuttings or divisions, because that is how the native plant supply chain can most quickly and easily produce plants at scale, we aren't in fact improving but the, the genetic biodiversity. We are just reproducing clones. And as we know in stories like the banana, when you get down to having only one variety of one species left of a species, that one plant is very vulnerable. That one set of genetics, mm -hmm. very vulnerable to loss based on disease or a predator or another kind of pest. And so we need that genetic biodiversity that comes from sexually reproduced seed production. That's so important Brilliant. because I think we're going into, well, we had the whole thing with, well, it's still going with all the pesticides. And so we get into that. And yet if the seed in the, you know, we use the seed more, yeah, the plant would be more sustainable and hardy, right? Yeah. So we wouldn't need these toxic pesticides. So when we talk about climate change and everything, you know, and that's what I find so fascinating about what we're talking about and what's happened, it's Margot's fault. She keeps going, go in the garden route. And I'm like, okay, but you know, <laughs> you know, but it's true because it's something people can actually do in their backyard Everyone. and even their patio space. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. And get kids involved. Kids will geek out on the seeds, man. And oh. then look, look, They'll become right. like Jennifer, you know, <laughs> look what next thing you know, they're going to have an award-winning podcast and all these books and all of this good stuff, you know, and, and get out there and actually understand that connection. And you don't want your kids frolicking in pesticides. No, you don't. You don't want them eating pesticides. You don't want them swimming in pesticides. You don't want their food growing in pesticides. And, 
And we don't like it's become such a knee jerk reaction. And we are told over and over again, Mm -hmm. oh, we can't do large scale agriculture without them. Like we can't. But that's not true. That is just Mm -hmm. the most convenient, easiest way. And we've figured out how to do really hard things as a as a species. We are smart and we are resourceful. We can do better than this. Yeah. Yeah. Margo, any other questions on sowing seeds? What we sow? I love the name, too. Because it's you're making us what we what are we sowing? What are we doing? Yeah, like you're, you're questioning yeah. us. I love the title, by the way. I'm questioning me as much as anyone. Like it is an interrogation of me as a gardener and what I know and don't know and what I should know and be more um, clear and intentional about. You know, and and what you just said about kids and seeds, like. I'm looking at 60 years old. It never gets old. Like looking at a oh. seed germinate and you're like, is it gonna, is it gonna? And then it does. And it and just, like, it never gets old. The magic is still so powerful. Yeah. I, I, I um, what you said uh, kind of blew my mind. It, it was a new information for me. And I don't know, you know, if I was doing this intuitively or what, but lately I've been growing my vegetables and letting them go to seed. I, I don't harvest them until they go to seed. Yeah. You know, I may, my lettuce, I may pull the leaves off, but all of a sudden I wait for the flower to come up and I wait for the seed. And, um, and I did the same thing with the onion that you were talking yeah. about. Yeah. And they have this beautiful round flower that I've never seen. And it's they, it goes to seed yeah and um the fact that that's part of evolution and the seed is going to uh, in, um build something more sustainable right uh than just reproducing you know by a bulb or what have you said um is brilliant and uh brilliant insight and now I'm understanding why I'm doing that because all this everybody was laughing at me all my all my vegetables were going to seed and they just laughing at me and I said I don't know why I'm doing it but I'm doing it and I'm collect collecting the seed and yeah yeah, and we can do that and 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 uh store the seed we can be a seed keeper yeah like Mm -hmm. like in your book yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And there's what something is- intimate, right? About mm-hmm. seeing the whole cycle. Yeah. Like, and maybe that's because I myself am aging. I'm not sure, but the, the, the ability to see a seed plant it, watch it grow and go all the way through the next cycle. It just reminds us that we are actually very small and we are part of something so much bigger. And that whole cycle reminds us where where our place is kind of and that's a beautiful thing to me you know i'm i I go even i'm i'm like that as well like if i see bird poo and there's seed in it or there's bear scat with berries and seeds i'm like dude okay can i go and plant it can i move it i'm like no (laughs) it needs to be dropped here let it be but i want to go like listen there's a hole i can make over here right you know that's but it is a cool thing. People go, oh, you. And I'm like, no, it's, we got it's cool. scat, man. Right. You know? yeah. Well, and it's, cool. it's the, it's nature's blender, right? That's, that's the margarita blender Fertilizer. right there. Yep. There it, it goes. is, the margarita and the fruit. Man, yep. we've got all around here. But it is, <laughs> you know, I think going to seed, we, we, um, we lived out in 29 Palms outside Joshua Tree National yep. Park and got this house and the soil, there was no soil. It was just toxic chemicals and everything we grew from seed we got you know it was organic pure wildflowers everything came out little tiny because the soil was just it had all the house chemicals from building and we read we, we just used we composted and composted we did um, bukashi which is this way of composting tea kind of thing and mm-hmm. we brought in manure we did all these things and we planted native plants it became this magical magical oasis yeah of, but but what being able to watch the seeds grow harvest going through that whole cycle out in the desert where you're not supposed to be able to grow things became this every day go out get the seed save the seed we had all these little envelopes but what happened is nancy got into basil 
And she's mm-hmm. like, no, we can do chocolate mint. You don't have to have just the green basil. Let's do the chocolate mint. Let's do these all these heritage ones. I don't know what happened, but the birds apparently decided we needed a field of basil. And we did. We had a field of basil because Nancy would not. She was like, let it go to seed. Let it go right, to seed. Right. And everybody's like, you're supposed to prune it back. Yeah. Funny. Well, we had we had basil forever. It was great. The bees love, the bees oh, the love, bees basil. love it. Oh, they love it. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. everyone, don't give up just the green basil, man. There's so many varieties. And mm-hmm. I, I wanted to touch on that real quick with you too, is variety, the biodiversity of what we're even putting in our bodies, right? So when we look at pesticides in, in food and agriculture, I think we're just going to have to always have these stronger pesticides because we're weakening what we're planting, right? And at the we, same time, weakening the topsoil and the soil. So if we're doing bio, like if we're doing diverse food, right, that comes from seed, it's stronger. It's stronger. And, you know, again, back to the diversity, it's not, I don't, you know, it's not that we necessarily weaken our food security by planting varieties, but it is important to plant a diversity and to support other seed growers and distributors by, you know, buying and trying a diversity and open pollinated organic seeds that you, that will come true from seed and you can save to plant again. That is what will help secure our seeds into the future, mm-hmm. and um, and and supporting local, independent, diverse offering seed companies. That's one of the greatest things you can do. But plant plant all the varieties you want, but plant a lot of open pollinated heirloom or heritage varieties to keep them in our system so that they don't they don't go away. Mm. What and was plant latest... organically, like plant oh, organically. God, yeah. Don't over till, don't overfeed, you know, and use no chemicals because because we can learn to do it without chemicals, period. Yeah. I, we were just in um the Appalachian Wood, like really in the in the national forest, and and the birds had taken seeds and planted them nicely in a side of the creek. And there were all kinds of melons and gourds growing from these birds healthy in nature it's like the I'm birds not. know let the birds plant i'm just saying <laughs> they didn't know how to well and, and 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 that is you know there is this i think it's important that we we not have a binary about like all seeds are good or all bird planted mm-hmm. seeds are good or all yeah right but because and, and this is where it's up to us as gardeners to say i am not going to plant an invasive plant mm-hmm. because the calculus of seed for the good is is equal to the calculus of seed for the bad. And mm-hmm. so if we offer our our birds and our mammals invasive plant seed to eat that they like, that will spread it everywhere. And they say something like 80% of all invasive plants in North America were introduced from gardens or the horticultural trade. And that is just heartbreaking because that, again, is hurting biodiversity, not helping it. Now, a melon, I'm not talking about a melon. A melon is yeah. is fine, but when you're talking about privet or you're talking about pampas grass or you're talking about, mm. you know, scotch broom or um, what's that other one? Star thistle that we are just overcome with in California. And, you know, and you can name five other invasive plants in every state in the country that's a little different. You know, that we don't want to see that and we don't want to add to that. So be careful with especially anything that has an invasive tendency. Just stay away from it. And if you see an invasive plant being offered for sale in one of your nurseries, tell them that it's an invasive plant, that it's listed as an invasive plant, and they should not be selling it anymore. Mm-hmm. And this is also a reason to go to local parks and get involved with yes. taking out the invasive plants That's because right. once you go out there and really have to take them out you'll understand oh. why we don't want them <laughs> yeah and and you'll see how they grow and why they're so successful because they don't have natural controls they they love whatever climate you're in they there are no you know birds or pests who eat it all the way to the ground and destroy it like they are very successful and they absolutely choke out other diversity that used to be there it's interesting 
in I've been to places where I've seen bromeliads grow in trees naturally, and yet we we put everything into I don't know we we commercialize everything to a point of like this is people forget bromeliads actually grow in the wild even in our own country same as orchids and yeah. you know it's like if we actually went back to our roots <laughs> literally um it would be good but I love what you're doing with your book your podcast oh, this thank is exciting you. oh I'm so happy to be here with help. you guys and really a pleasure to meet you Margo and your photography you is gorgeous so thank you keep, keep doing what you're doing I love it Thank you. You too. You too. Uh, best yeah. of wishes. And everyone, again, uh, let me give it the book. It is, oh, you've got to go get it. What we sow on the personal, ecological, and cultural significance of seeds. Go to cultivatingplace.com. It is out now as we air this. And happy fall, everybody. The first thing we can do is um, hey. also um, don't rake all your leaves. Just saying. Don't so. rake all your leaves. Happy Equinox. And Take care. the book the book is available wherever you get your books. And if you buy it from a, a retailer and you send me an email, cultivatingplace at gmail.com, I am happy to send you a signed book plate to put in your uh into oh. your book. Very Great. nice. And don't okay. forget bookshop.org, everyone. They yep. support independent bookstores. We love that. We and love of that. Of course, uh, you got to go keep up with Margo as well. Go to her website, PereraFineArtGallery.com. Keep up with us at BigBlendRadio.com. All the links that we're talking about are in the show notes, uh, no matter where you're listening or watching. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Margo. Thank, Thank you, you, Lisa. Thank you, Margo. Thanks, Bye. Bye.